Hey everyone, uh, now we're going to talk about relative strength as a criterion for investment selection. Uh, a lot of Wall Street and a lot of the investment firms work on relative strength. Um, you know, we've, I'm pretty sure we've talked about this before from a portfolio basis that a portfolio manager, uh, they are being judged against their performance against an index. So often when they set up a portfolio, maybe it's an emerging markets portfolio, they're being judged against the emerging markets index, or if it's a large cap US stock portfolio, they'll be judged against the S&P 500. And so when they look at what they're going to put in their portfolio, they want to outperform. And so they're looking for um, stocks that have got strong relative strength uh, against the S&P index, so that they're uh, overweighting their portfolio with those stocks that are outperforming the index. And this is where relative strength comes in. And I've got to say that within um, you know, all the, the products that we sell and, and the tools that are used um, at a professional level, our relative index um, tools, the RRG and the relative index comparison tools are probably the most popular um, you know, with professionals as well. So it's definitely a very important subject, one that we've got to make sure that we understand. Um, and so let's get through this. So uh, relative strength is driving uh, the change in price by the security. And it's because of all those reasons, because when um, portfolio managers see that an equity starts to outperform the uh, benchmark, they want to have that security in their portfolio, which then adds to the buying, which then pushes the price up further and further. So it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, in there. Um, and, and so what we're basically doing is we're taking the price of the security, we're dividing it by a benchmark. So let's just say the S&P, we take Microsoft, divide its value by the value of the S&P, and we have a ratio line. And we look at that ratio line. Now again, like with on-balance volume and a lot of our other indicators, uh, the value of that line is meaningless but the direction of it is very important. Is it going up, is it going down? Are we seeing you know, even divergences and patterns? And there's all sorts of analysis that we could do on those lines. Uh, so it creates a ratio that we can use to see if the security is outperforming or underperforming the benchmark. So using relative strength, there's a couple of different ways that we can use it, but what we've found and what there's been numerous research on relative strength uh, since it really came to the fore. You know, people like Gartley in the 30s were talking about this, uh, so it's not a new concept, but it disappeared and we didn't have see many writings about this for a long time. Um, but around the 80s, 90s, it sort of really came back again uh, and now has become a, a very important part of the investment process. Um, but basically a, a way of doing this is then ranking stocks and securities um, by their, their past relative performance. Um, so we can look at maybe a six month look back and say, right, well, if I've got the, pri the relative value today and the re relative value six months ago, what's the percentage change? And then I can take that for all the securities and rank them all. So it's just a way of calculating and ranking based on, on these relative measures since the actual value is meaningless to us. Um, what the studies have found is that top stocks that are ranked like that, they tend to continue outperforming the market um, for the near future. So basically they, they end up being the, the best performers. Bottom ranking stocks tend to continue their poor performance um, after that point as well. Um, selecting the highest past performing stocks, select the highest past performing stocks for investment avoid lower past performing stocks as they tend to continue their poor performance. Subclassifications also improve results. So for instance, Levy um, did some research there and in his study, what he found was that um, not only taking the outperformers, but taking the outperformers that hi had higher volatility uh, led to better results than just the taking the outperformers on their own. So again, it's looking at these things, and this is again a big part of why you do the CMT and why you learn about technical analysis. It's, it's having that understanding and saying, okay, well, this indicator's good, or this model's good, uh, relative performance is working well, but if I layer on that a volatility study, you know, does that improve my results? 
And so we do this layered approach as we build these models as well. So the value of relative strength studies, ranking stocks by relative strength uh, considered. So this is now, uh, you know, looking at these and ranking them and, and finding these outperformers as well. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the text goes on to talk about is how co-movement of stocks, you know, they tend to move together. So that's a, another big part of, of the, uh, the relative strength study. Um, it does demonstrate flaws in the, um, uh, the assumptions made by efficient markets. Um, that everything you know that doesn't yield the fact that the best performing stock on a relative basis continues to be the best performing stock on a relative basis really flies in the face of the randomness um, that efficient markets would uh, expect you know efficient markets would expect that a stock that's outperformed is going to um, be quickly pulled back um, either by arbitrage type scenarios and, and things like that so um, it basically that also corroborates the work by Pharma French uh, and their serial, serial correlation studies uh, that they did, also called run analysis. So we've got these two things. Relative strength is helping to um, debunk the efficient market hypothesis that everything's random and it can't be predicted and there's nothing to be gained, pretty much out of technical analysis. Um, so that's, that's good there. Relative strength has been shown to be an indicator of our performance at longer hold times. Levy's study suggested six month hold times uh, helps there. The concept extends to markets as well as individual stocks. So we could talk about, uh, even from an international point of view, let me take the MSCI World Index as my benchmark. Let me look at all the countries uh, and let me see which countries are outperforming, which ones are underperforming. Uh, and then I can and look at that. We talk about here at Optima about closed systems where this type of relative work is always best done when the benchmark completely includes all of the, the different constituents that we're looking at. You know, if I was to compare the US against the MSCI world and not consider the other countries, well then I'm not really getting you know, a true picture. It's always good to have this closed universe when we're doing this type of work. Um, divergence, the study of performance, you know, between high ranking and low ranking stocks assists with um, timing as well. So, you know, what's happening with the different groups? Uh, looking at the high ranking stocks uh, in their relative strength and looking at the low ranking. You know, in some respects, we've talked about in breadth and the advanced decline how the large cap stocks could be continuing to go up while the small caps are starting to fall away and looking for that divergence. Well, we can do that sort of divergence as well, purely on relative um, strength and saying, let's take the top 10%, the bottom 10% out of our universe and let's plot what they're doing. And when we start seeing divergences between those two groups, that can help us with our market timing as well. So lots of value to relative strength strategies and, and the studies that are, are going on there. Another chart that I found on the internet, which actually highlights this as well, taking the uh, top 10% uh, and the bottom, you know, basically grouping up these stocks on the US market into um, deciles and then seeing. So from 19, I've got to read that on the side, 1927 onwards, it tracked the performance. And you can see, you know, when you look at this red line at the top here, um, you know, you can see that it maintains its position. It doesn't change away from being the outperformers. Uh, there's a few little crosses in the middle there where different groups changed, but uh, on generally they hold their, um, their persistence as they, as they continue. All right, so the next part of this chapter is looking at correlation coefficients. Now, correlation is a big part of relative strength analysis and looking at different markets and saying, well, how strongly are they correlated? Um, so what we look at here is the correlation coefficient, R. Sounds scary, if you've not done stats, we'll do a bit of a stats module later, um, but you, know, you don't have to worry about that. So when we've got um, uh, points like this, so you know, we've got these uh, points here, what we do with this, sorry, let me take a step back. When you've got two securities and you wanna know um, are they correlated are they, or aren't they? We do what we call a, a regression analysis. 
which ends up in a chart like this. So let's just say I've got Microsoft and I've got the S&P 500. What I do is for every week, I look at the gains in Microsoft and I say, okay, did Microsoft go up? Did it go down? By how much on a percentage gain basis? Then I do the same week on the S&P. And I say, okay, when Microsoft went up 1% for this week, what did the S&P do? Did it go up 1%? Did it go down? Uh, et cetera. And then I, I plot those. So for instance, along here, I may have um, the, the gain of the S&P 500. And up here, I have the gain of Microsoft. And so I can look at that and say, right, let me plot these points on the chart as, you know, the gain of the S&P being my X coordinate, the gain of Microsoft being my Y coordinate. And we do that for every week that we're looking at to, to work this out. Now, what often happens is it probably looks a little more like this one, where they're not so strongly correlated. But if these two markets were perfectly correlated, then what you're going to see is a line like this where the line of best fit through all of those dots is very, very clear. We call that a perfect positive correlation um, because the line is just so perfect. A, a incremental increase in the performance of the S&P is going to lead to, to a proportional increase in the returns of Microsoft. So that's perfect correlation. Then next to it, you can see we've got strong positive correlation. Um, and then you can see here weak correlation. You know, the line of best fit would be drawn, but the variance around that line. Now, we've talked about this in standard deviation. When you've got a moving average, you know, we've gone back 10 days, we've calculated the moving average. What we do to get the standard deviation is first of all, we take that average and we say, okay, now how did all of those 10 days differ? What did they vary? Um, from that average. You know, uh, the first day may be a value of 10 when the average was 7. So its variance was 3. Now, what we do with that then is we take those variances, we average them, and we square them. And that what, the reason we, we square all those variances is that we want to take sign out. We don't want to have pluses and negatives because they'd cancel each other out in the average. So we square them before we divide by 10. Now, that's R squared. Um, and so if we took the square root of that, well, that would be the value of R. So often in statistics, you talk about R squared, you hear them talk about R squared and R. They are purely measures of how well that line of best fit fits the data that we're looking at. Uh, and so that's what we've got there. Um, what we've got in the middle is obviously no correlation, no line of best fit could be drawn. And then we go into our negatives. So we've got negative weak meaning that for an incremental increase, let's say in the S&P, we actually have a decrease in the returns that we would get from Microsoft. So we call that negative correlation, strong negative col col uh, co correlation, sorry, it's a bit of a tongue twister, and perfect negative correlation uh, are all listed there. So the values typically range from one being perfect through to minus one, being perfect negative correlation. The mistake that a lot of people make is you know, they think of one as being perfect and negative one as being uncorrelated. It's not true. Negative one is perfect negative correlation and zero is completely uncorrelated. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that you've got that uh, clear in your mind. So the correlation coefficient, uh, you know, that value changes over time. So when we talk about data sets and we look at data and we look at returns and things, you know, there's seasons again where Microsoft is going to be heavily correlated with the S&P, but then there's seasons where it's not. So we use a tool more like the Pearson's correlation where it's telling us what that value is. So you can see even here on this chart, um, you know, we've got 0.66 as the value right now, uh, if I can just find my pointer. Um, but when we go back a number of months into September last year, you know, they were negatively correlated. The moves that we were seeing in um, the, uh, whichever stock this is, this is the spider, um, you know, but the moves we were seeing in, in that versus the general market just wasn't being correlated there. 
Um, I can't quite read that on my screen uh, in front of me. Highly correlated securities then, they remain at extreme values for the majority of time. So that's what makes them highly correlated. You're going to see cases where one's uh, um, up at one and then they're down at minus one. And so generally we'd say that no, it's not a highly correlated security. We're looking for something which is going to be well above that line um, for the majority of the time. And then we would say, hey, that's a highly correlated pair of securities. Uh, and we can use that to help us as we're building models and doing things like that. So that's um, relative strength as a criterion for investment selection. Uh, you need to be able to define relative strength, how it's the division of a equity divided by a benchmark. Uh, you've got to be able to describe how it's used uh, in the way it's ranked. And, and just remember those types of things like the six month lookup uh, for that type of work. Um, obviously the value of the studies in, in A, how it um, debunks um, uh, some of the assumptions of the efficient markets hypothesis, but also how we can use it and how um, outperformers persist um, in their performance and outperforming and underperformers persist in underperforming. Uh, and then the other learning objective out of this chapter was identifying a correlation coefficient. So if you're given a chart, like any one of those seven charts that we had there, um, you need to be able to say, yep, they're highly correlated, they're negatively correlated, uh, and things like that. Wonderful. So that's relative strength as a criterion for investment selection, and we'll keep going in the next session, the next video. Thank you.